break it down into bite-sized manageable pieces that build on themselves and are cumulative and are logical is, is exactly what we do in the Barton Reading and Spelling System. And Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Director of Marketing. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. Well, happy October, Andrew. Happy October, Julie. Do you know that this month is, among other things, National Dyslexia Month? I did not know that. It could also be National Penguin Month, and I wouldn't know that either. (laughs) But I'm glad we have a month for dyslexia awareness. It's good to have that conversation. Yes, I know that we've had many families who have students with dyslexia, families and teachers of students with dyslexia who have had great success with our materials. So I thought it would be a great idea for us to spend some time talking about dyslexia, and I thought it would be great to have a guest on our show, and who better than Susan Barton? Who better than Susan Barton? She is well-known in the world of reading and reading strategies and helping kids who struggle. We even had one of our little students right here in this building was telling me in his end-of-the-year essay uh, how he had worked so well with the Susan Barton material. So it's exciting. We've got her on the line. We do. She's in Canada? I'm in Canada today, although our main office is in San Jose, California. Well, welcome. Good good to have you. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. So I would say uh, I probably do more homeschool live events perhaps than you do. I travel around and do 10 to 15, you know, state type conferences a year. And I would say that easily one third of the families I talk to have one or more children who struggle with reading and writing and putting letters on paper and using their eyes. And it seems to be either it just is a growing problem or it's something that more and more people are becoming aware of. Do you have a sense? I'm just curious what you think. Is is Are reading problems growing nationwide, or are we just becoming more sensitive and aware to that? Dyslexia itself is not increasing, and it is the most common reason a bright child will struggle during the early years with reading, writing, and spelling. But definitely our awareness of it is growing by leaps and bounds. Now we've had research on dyslexia since the 1930s, but thanks to a very proactive group of parents that started an organization called Decoding Dyslexia, which is in every state and every province of Canada, they've been able to band together and get states to pass dyslexia laws, requiring schools to screen for dyslexia and raising awareness of dyslexia, getting Dyslexia Awareness Month declared, and so on. So our awareness of it has grown tremendously. And that should be, I would think, very helpful to the families and the kids who could, if they didn't know, just think themselves very stupid and kind of give up early on in the whole game. I'm sure you've seen that. Sadly, I've seen that way too many times. And so one of the most common questions that parents will will say is, I think my son, I think my daughter might be dyslexic. Do you think I should have them tested? Well, for me, that's kind of a difficult question to give a, a categorical answer to. How would you answer that in terms of if someone you didn't know just came up to you and said that at a conference or a meeting What advice would you give them, or what questions, I guess, would you ask them? My first advice would be to go to our Dyslexia website and watch my free three-hour presentation called Dyslexia Symptoms and Solutions. And the reason I advise that first is many people 
don't understand what dyslexia is. And by the time they watch that video, which is free, they will understand what it is, what the symptoms are, what it looks like, why it runs in families. And they'll have a pretty good feel that either my child fits this profile or not, doesn't fit it at all. Because nothing can mimic dyslexia but dyslexia. And then if they think there is dyslexia there, they're pretty convinced, do they need testing? It all depends on what type of educational setting they are in. If they are homeschooled, then I would say, if you're convinced it's dyslexia, you don't have to have testing to prove it to anybody. You have control of the curriculum and the accommodations. Just go ahead and start providing what that child needs. But if they are in a public school, sometimes they need to get testing in order to prove it because public schools are sometimes a little bit more rigid and won't provide accommodations unless there's testing to prove it. Hmm, good. When you say accommodations, could you give us some examples of what parents at home or schools would do once they um, believe that they do have truly have a case of a dyslexic child? Accommodations are not fixing the underlying reading, writing, spelling issues. They're working around it so the child can learn and prove his knowledge, even though he's still behind in reading, writing, spelling. So typical accommodations are, since he can't yet read the textbooks, but he needs to know what's in the textbook, either read it to him or get him the textbook on audio from organizations like Learning Ally or um, Bookshare. They would be, let him dictate written work. So it's, he's still doing the work. He's still figuring out the answers, but somebody else is writing it down. It would be things like, on a test. If a child with dyslexia fails a written test, is it because they couldn't read it or didn't know how to write the answers or they just didn't know the answers? Well, one way you'll find out is to get rid of print. Have somebody ask each question out loud, let the child answer out loud, and that then you'll know. So the accommodations are working around their weak areas to give them access to the curriculum and let them prove their knowledge without print. Now, of course, accommodations are only half the solution. That works around it. We also want to fix and improve their weak skills. I'm wondering if you encounter parents or teachers who have resistance to that idea and and have this perhaps erroneous concept that by reading it to them or letting them dictate or doing the test verbally and orally, is that isn't that like cheating? Are they really learning? if that's the case. How do you respond to people who either hint at or directly worry about that issue? Yes, I run into that quite a bit. Uh, From parents initially, oftentimes from teachers who don't know much about dyslexia or understand it very well yet. They think if I let let my child listen to audiobooks, that will make him lazy. That will make him never wanna read a book. You know, how do I encourage him to get tutoring if he can just listen to it? And I tell them, don't you think your child wants to be able to read like everyone else? Mm, yep. Don't you think he goes to bed every night and prays to God, please, 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 when I wake up in the morning, let me be able to read like everyone else? Mm. He desperately wants to be able to read like everyone else. But he you can't know, yet. He hasn't had the right type of instruction So ideally, accommodations are temporary. Mm -hmm. While somebody is working with them one-on-one, building their skills so that eventually they'll be able to read it by themselves. But audiobooks are essential so that they can access the curriculum, learn through their ears. It's called ear reading. You can read through your eyes. You can read through your ears. If you're blind, you can read through your fingers. And they'll get exposed to the content of books. You can build a love of reading and a love of books by listening to them. Mm -hmm. It also exposes them to not only the content, but also the vocabulary. And vocabulary is a critical aspect of comprehension. So no, it will not make a child lazy. It's a workaround, a temporary solution to give him access until somebody has tutored him and he's able to do it on his own. Yeah, and that's a message that we we have to continuously reaffirm because even I, 
who knew a lot or thought I did when I had, you know, my son not reading at 10 and my wife said, well, let's join this association for the blind and dyslexic and he can then have virtually unlimited audiobooks. I remember thinking, if we do this, he'll never learn to read. He'll just, it'll be a crutch forever. And then, of course, I, I thought, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? He doesn't grow up and read. But, okay, I don't know that reading is a prerequisite for having a happy life or getting to heaven. So I just kind of let it go and said, if he never reads, I'm okay with that. And it was interesting because me letting go of my attachment to him reading was kind of the beginning of making progress with the whole thing. Have you found other parents that it's just their anxiety is almost more of a problem in the dynamic there in the home between the parent and the kid than than the actual problem itself? Oh, yes. I hear that all the time. I mean, I spend 12 hours a day, five days a week, and have for over 20 years talking to parents on the phone and by email, of course. And I think it's more important to educate a parent than to educate the child, because until the parent gets it, we don't have much chance of helping the child. And if the parent gives the ad- attitude, and the children will pick up it early, if you listen to an audiobook, it's cheating. Yeah. Well, what do you think it tells the child? Mm. So yeah, until a parent gets it, a child won't get it. So that's Could- why... I formed Bright Solutions for Dyslexia, which is a free information and resource center to educate parents and teachers and other professionals about what it is, what it isn't, what it looks like, how to help. And I'm still doing that 20 years later and probably will continue to do that until they bury me in the ground because (laughs) it's critical. Yeah. Well, I know that you are a very mission-driven person. That comes through very clearly. You mentioned a couple sources of of books that people audiobooks that people mm-hmm. could get. Could you re- restate those? Oh, sure. One was called, and there were many, many, many others. But the two sure. main sources of textbooks on audio, right, right, is an organization. One of them is called Learning Ally. Learning and the Ally. The website is www. Period. Learning Ally, which is spelled A L L Y. dot O R G. And they are the ones your son used. They used to be called Recordings for the Blind and Dyslexic, but they right. changed their name about 10 years ago. Okay. Good. And a parent can get a membership. A school can get a school-wide membership. And I sure wish they would, because if a school had a school-wide membership, then they can provide audiobooks for free to anybody in their school who needs them. But parents can also get a parent membership. And their textbooks are recorded by humans, not by computers, which is why they're my favorite. In fact, I've been to the recording studios and they don't allow someone to record a science textbook unless they have a degree in science Mm. and so on, so that they know how to pronounce the words and the emphasis and can explain things. The other uh, major source of textbooks on audio is uh, Bookshare. So it's www.bookshare.org, but their textbooks are recorded by computers. And a lot of my kids find that objectionable. Mm. Yeah, kind of grating. If you're you're used to listening to well-read books, going to badly read books or (laughs) synthetically created audiobooks can be a little bit painful, I think. Yes, it can. Of course, there are other sources of of books that are not textbooks. Libraries often have audiobooks that you can check out and so on. And I provide to anybody who would like I can provide a list of sources of of audio textbooks, but there are many, many these days, which is great. So Susan, we'll put a link in our show notes to a way that they can contact you for that list. Okay. Would that be helpful? It sure would. Yeah. Now, can I just ask a question? I used to teach back many, many, many years ago, first and second grade. And a lot of times those little guys, they're getting their B's and D's mixed up, their P's and Q's. And it's really just a matter of, in my experience, they're just not done growing yet. And eventually it resolves itself as their brains get a little older. 
Would you qualify that as dyslexia or not? Not necessarily. Letter reversals that happen during the first two years of handwriting instruction and practice are considered perfectly normal. It's ways kids learn. But if so, these days they teach handwriting usually in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So in kindergarten and first grade, that's your first two years of handwriting instruction and practice. Confusions with those letters are common in all kids at that age. It's if they continue after two full years of handwriting instruction and practice, that would be one of many warning signs of dyslexia. Children with dyslexia don't have just one warning sign. They should have many, many, many of them. So BD reversals and confusions that continue into second grade and beyond would be one of many warning signs. But nobody would ever say dyslexia with just one single warning sign. Mm -hmm. Great, great. You had mentioned that that you recommend accommodations and you gave us some. And then you said that there's the right type of instruction. Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. I am accommodations alone. You can survive in school and college with accommodations alone, especially today with so many wonderful technology tools available. But I don't think accommodations alone are what most people want. It's not what I want. I want accommodations to be temporary while somebody is providing the right type of intense, systematic, multisensory, explicit instruction in how to read, write, and spell. So to me, a solution is two-pronged, accommodations until they don't need them, and they won't need them once they get enough of the right type of instruction so that they can read, write, and spell through their eyes, through their fingers. And so ideally, for the right solution, a child would get both. Now, I know that a lot of people have come to us struggling with dyslexia and have used some of our materials and have found great success. And I know, Susan, that you recommend IEW to students often or occasionally. What is it about IEW that you find that's helpful to students with dyslexia? So let me clarify that. Yes, I love IEW. The right type of reading, writing, spelling instruction starts and there's tons of research to support this, with a really good, solid Orton-Gillingham-based system. And there are many good ones to choose from. I list the seven most well-known ones on my dyslexia website, which is www.brightsolutions.us. Along the top, just click on the tab, How to Get Help, and then click on Orton-Gillingham. But most Orton-Gillingham systems, including the one I developed, the Barton Reading and Spelling System, don't go into written expression. We're working on phonemic awareness, decoding, spelling, basic grammar, sentence structure, but not how to compose a paragraph, how to compose a five-paragraph compare-contrast essay. And kids with dyslexia need to be taught that as step-by-step as they're taught how to read and how to spell individual words. Now, when I originally created the Barton Reading and Spelling System, I thought that someday I would come back and create a written expression program because I worked in a dyslexia clinic for many years and used many different programs for that. And I knew that was needed. But someone who was using the Barton System showed me the IEW written expression program, and I was Mm. blown away. It was so good and so beautiful. It's like, I couldn't do anything better ever. So why recreate the wheel? So yes, I strongly recommend that people who are using the Barton system, once their student has finished level four, that means they can read and spell easily multi-syllable words and have basic sentence structure and basic capitalization and punctuation. Add on the IEW written expression program so that children will continue to learn other things about reading and spelling as they continue through the Barton system, but they'll also start learning how to compose and write good essays. And Andrew, your program is brilliant. Well, we think so. (laughs) We're very, very grateful. I think one of the things I've noticed is that dyslexic kids can very easily get overwhelmed by complexity. So, you know, the the visual point aside... Trying to do many things all at once seems to also be a difficult thing. And when you say to a child here, write what you're thinking, 
they have to, well, find a thought, and then they have to put that into words, then they have to say it to themselves, then they have to hear what they said to themselves, then they have to remember what they heard themselves say to themselves, then they have to wrestle some letters they might be able to spell into an order that makes sense, Mm -hmm. and by the time they've got a few words down, they may have forgotten what they heard themselves say to themselves and have to go all the way back to find the original maybe abstract concept and start all over again. That can be overwhelming for any young child, but I think for the kids who have the uh, dyslexic tendencies or or flat out serious dyslexia, it, it just blows them away trying to do all those things at once. So I'm sure in your experience as well, breaking things into very small, concrete, manageable steps, do this, don't worry about anything else. Okay, now do this next thing. Don't worry about anything else. Would you say that's typical of successful instruction? Absolutely. Break it down into bite-sized manageable pieces that build on themselves and are cumulative and are logical is, is exactly what we do in the Barton Reading and Spelling System and any good Orton-Gillingham system does. So yes, they mesh very nicely. But it's interesting, Andrew, one thing I also tell professional Barton tutors when I'm encouraging them to do this or parents I said, although he claims to be teaching written expression in this, and he is, he's also sneaking in study skills, how to read a book and take notes and then write from your notes. And that is a fabulous skill that you will need in high school and college. So in my opinion, you're doing two things at the same time. Sneakily, I might add. Sne- sneaking, well, <laughs> surreptitiously. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's so true. And I've had kids who went off to college, came back and said, hey, I, I still use keyword outlines in my college classes. So you're absolutely right. I, I have a question that I, I do not have an answer for, and I knew we were going to have a chance to talk. And I really wanted to ask you this question because I just don't know. I have a man who started working for us recently, both he and his wife, Uh, are very dyslexic, and he was telling me about this special font that you can get that has the letters, I don't know, weighted, I guess, in a certain Mm -hmm. way, and that this should be or could be helpful if you have some text and you, you change it into this font and then you print that out. It's easier for kids to read. Do you have any experience with that? Oh, yes. And there is no research that supports the effectiveness of the dyslexia font. That's what it's called, dyslexia. There have been several fonts over the last 20 years that have come out. However, it is true that certain types of fonts and certain spacing in fonts are more helpful than others, but it doesn't have to be that special dyslexia font. And if somebody wants to know more about what fonts are good and what's kind of spacing, I do have research as an email that I can send out to someone. Yeah, that could be very interesting because now it's so easy for people to get text and put it into any font size or spacing or format and provide that for students and make it easier for them to see and read. So we have this amazing technology now that even 20 years ago didn't exist in, in any similar form. So yes, so people can email you for advice on Best font and layout for dyslexic readers. Yes, they can. Wow, Susan, are you prepared to get thousands of emails? <laughs> she already gets thousands yes, of I, emails. Yes, we are. We, we get thousands every week. <laughs> Great. I'm sure she must We're have We're delighted a, to a very... answer them. We work very, very hard to answer everybody within 12 hours. Well, just because it's timely, what is a good email address that we can give our listeners? Okay. Um, My first name, Susan, which is spelled the traditional way, S-U-S-A-N, and then the at symbol, and then the word bright, spelled B-R-I-G-H-T, followed by the word solutions with an S on the end, and bright solutions is run together as one long word, dot U-S, which stands for United States. I, I had another question This is great because I get questions and people think I know, and then I have to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'd like to maybe get your take, and this is a huge subject. This could probably be the subject of an entire second podcast, but some dyslexic kids 
as you know, as I know, because my son would fall in this category, have tremendous auditory memories. They love audiobooks. They memorize pretty easily. They can sit in a lecture and and narrate back, you know, almost point by point everything that happened. And this carries them through quite well academically, especially if they make use of audio textbooks and things like that. But there's also a good chunk of kids who have, I think, several or many of the symptoms of dyslexia, but they also have auditory processing issues where they do not have that type of auditory memory. They scramble things up on the way in, and then that affects their uh, language ability to, to put language out because, you know, what goes in is going to determine to some degree what comes out. What is the best approach for parents who have these kids that have not just one problem, but more problems? We might call them our beloved kinesthetic learners, but I'm sure you've bumped into kids like I've described here. Oh, absolutely. And that's the joy and the challenge of working with our kids. Dys- some kids have just dyslexia. And even just dyslexia ranges from very mild to profound. But many kids have more than just dyslexia. It's very common, for instance, for kids to have both dyslexia and ADD, which is a whole other un- 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 misunderstood topic, which comes with and without hyperactivity from mild to profound. And if you have both of those, then you might have trouble staying focused on an audiobook because your mind is so active. As soon as you hear something, you're off on a daydream about that and you miss the whole rest of the book. But of yeah. course, kids can have more than just two things. There are what I call complex kids that have multitude of issues. And then we have to determine you know, what issues they have and which ones are most critical to take care of first and the most effective way. And that's often when getting a full evaluation by a pediatric neuropsych is useful. Mm-hmm. And they seem to have more than just dyslexia or ADD because handling both those issues is not enough to give this child success. Hence that there's more than we've discovered so far. And let's go find out what, it, what, what all, all the issues are that this child is dealing with so that it can lead to a prioritized action plan. Okay. Priorities. Yeah. What to, what to work on and think about first. That's really what so many parents need is they need help in that because they get overwhelmed with the symptoms and problems and different labels and people, of course, all their friends and relatives have advice (laughs) and it it can swirl about the head. And, and, you know, I'm sure you've had it, but I've had some moms just kind of break into tears right there in the middle of the conference center. I I don't even know how to start dealing with this. And I, I don't believe the school is the right place, but I don't know what to do. So, well, it's good to know that you have exhaustive resources that we can send people to. Is there anything um, else other than what can be found on your website, uh, any particular book titles or other resources that you do recommend? Oh, I have tons of resources I can recommend. I have several websites. I have one just for the Barton Reading and Spelling System, which is bartonreading.com. I have my in-depth dyslexia website, which I already gave you the, I gave you the email to. The website itself is just www.brightsolutions.us. And I have started doing Facebook live videos that are on one subject only and last for six to 10 minutes. I have 18 of them so far. And they're on a website called asksusanbarton.com. But I also have Wonderful books. Now, since dyslexia runs in families, I often don't recommend books because oftentimes a parent doesn't read very well either. That's why I tend to do podcasts and videos more than books. But by far the best book on dyslexia is by Dr. Sally Shaywitz called Overcoming Dyslexia. And it's available in virtually every bookstore in the nation. It's available on audio from many different sources. Um, And I have a list of other books, about 20 other books on my dyslexia website, brightsolutions.us, under more resources than click on books. I've also got lists of other really good websites there as well. And we'll put a link directly to those more resources on our show notes. Okay. Susan, one thing that comes through to me is you have a tremendous intensity of commitment to what you're doing. And I find it encouraging just to hear 
the preciseness with mm-hmm. which you speak, the way that you organize and present. Uh, I wish we had more time because I think there are so many more aspects of this, but uh, I just commend you for your lifetime of work, and I know the thousands or probably by now hundreds of thousands of children who have been uh, so helped by your work and uh, just keep it up and I hope we meet on the road somewhere someday Uh, but you are definitely an inspiration to me. Well thank you and the reverse is also true. I admire what you do. I've heard you speak at conferences and you're fabulous. We do our best here. Anything else Julie? I think I just speak for all the listeners, both parents of students in schools or homeschools, that we are grateful, Susan, for what you contribute to their success and actually to our success, quite frankly. So thank you. And thank you for being a part of this podcast. We'll have to do it again. It sounds like we've got some unexplored topics to still address. We hardly talked about writing at all. I know. It's true. (laughs) It's true. Until next time, then. All righty. Thank you so much. Thanks, Susan. You're welcome. Bye. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. Or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcasts. Until then, on behalf of Andrew Poudois and the team at IEW, I thank you for the privilege of allowing us to partner with you on your journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking. <laughs>